Welcome everyone. Um, this is the Santa Barbara Response Network, Compassion Center Live on Facebook. And we've been doing these uh, Compassion Centers since the beginning of COVID, so for over a year on Facebook, where we have the opportunity to speak with members of our community about their work and update you on important topics that I feel impact our mental health and our physical health. So I'm really happy today to have Bianca Orozco. Did I say that correct? You yeah, know, you did, yes. From Dessa, which is, um, you know, our sexual assault um, agency here. And Stessa has been doing amazing work in the community and I'm really, really pleased to have her here. This is Sexual Assault Awareness Month. And so this is an important topic for us to address. Um, I just wanted to um, inform people that Santa Barbara Response Network is here offering psychological first aid in English and Spanish um, and soon to be Misteco. And you can call us 24 seven at 699-5608. And our website is sbresponsenetwork.org. And we will put the information for Stessa as well. It's stessa.org. Is there a number, Bianca, that you'd like to share that people yes, can write it is our Yes, it is our hotline. Um, and I want to make sure that I give you the correct number. I, I think I have it memorized and then I don't want to say the wrong one, but it is 805-564-3696. Um, um, and that is our confidential and bilingual 24-hour hotline for folks. Um, this is a resource not only for survivors of sexual assault, but for any loved ones anyone who has a question about sexual assault, a question about our services, um, that is a resource for you. Thank you. And we're going to attempt to speak slowly. We're having simultaneous translation in Spanish. So this recorded um, interview will also be available in Spanish. So I wanna introduce Bianca and she's the community education coordinator for standing together against sexual assault. She works with students and I've had the opportunity to work with her with some responses in local schools, parents, and she brings awareness to the issue of sexual assault. Talk about attitudes, things we can do. And it says that her goal is to inform our community and society to take place what we can do to make this a safe place to prevent sexual assault. And I think this is so important. And we're hoping this time together that we can educate as many people as we can. Um, so Bianca, I wanted to start by asking you, um, this is Sexual Awareness Month, and I know you have a lot of activities um, each month. And could you share with us some of the activities on the campaign that you're launching? Of course, yeah. So every year to commemorate Sexual Assault Awareness Month, um, what we do at Standing Together to End Sexual Assault is we uh, launch a campaign that focuses on a specific population in our community. And the population that we're focusing on this year is youth, youth in our community. Um, with my work that I do, with the education that I do, I realize that youth know or have heard about sexual assault before. They get their information from social media, whatever they hear from their peers, um, if it's from their family members, it's from a TV show, sometimes directly if they experience sexual assault. Um, so I think it's very important that we take the time to uplift their voices and uplift um, you know, the things that they have to say. And so what we're doing this year, our campaign is called Create to Prevent. It's our second year doing a virtual campaign because of the pandemic. Um, but we're asking youth in our community to submit original creations that focus on the topic of sexual assault, um, specifically cyber sexual harassment. So anything that occurs online and we're doing a lot of education around cyber sexual harassment on our social media platforms. Um, but it could also be about consent. It could be about um, boundaries, supporting survivors. And really it's a contest. So if we ask folks, you know, submit either it's poetry, it could be a painting, it could be a drawing, it could be a TikTok video. 
um, we're going to be choosing winners in different categories. And the ultimate prize is a pair of Beats headphones, which I think are so important right now, especially the noise canceling ones if folks are doing school from home still. Um, but that, that's um, the main prize is also gift cards and Stessa swag. Um, but a lot of the events too that we have going on in April is to support the campaign. So I mentioned that we'll be educating our community about cyber sexual harassment through our social media platforms. So letting folks know, you know, what does cyber sexual harassment look like? How are folks, you know, sexually harassing others online? Um, how can we step in and say something if we do see it? Things like that, um, along with a virtual book club that we have and the first meeting is tomorrow. I've never been a part of a book club, so I'm very excited. And um, I've actually had trouble finishing a book during the pandemic, so this is a great opportunity for me. Um, but it's on the book Bear Town, and it focuses on a sexual assault that occurs in a small town. And this small town is a very, um, they're big fans of hockey, like they, that's like a hockey town. And the person who is the perpetrator is their star player and he sexually assaults um, a 15 year old girl who is one of the coach's daughters or the general manager's daughter. So there's a lot of divide in the community. And these are often conversations that we see um, when sexual assault is disclosed where people are like taking sides or making comments about the survivor. So we're really trying to start a conversation around that. Um, and then of course, Denim Day, which is in April 28th. We're asking our community members, we're asking um, local organizations to wear denim on that day to bring awareness to victim blaming and then to post their pictures on social media because we want to get that information out there. Um, and then every time they post, that is an entry into a raffle. Yeah, we've got a lot going on this oh, month. That's, that's great. You do, and really great stuff. I mean, when I, if I go to stessa.org, I can find out everything um, about these. Um, events it's all on your website right so i can share if you go to our website you'll find the the create to prevent um flyer but then all the other i can we can also share the calendar on there but the calendar of events are on our facebook our instagram um and our social media platforms and th there was something i wanted to ask you that you touched upon um i remember in my youth that we didn't talk as openly about sexual assault. Um, we didn't even call it sexual assault. Um, and I think there are a lot of myths about what is sexual assault. Mm -hmm. When do you consider it an assault? Can you talk a little bit about some of the myths people might have, ways they might minimize it or don't want to see it? What would you say about that? Yeah, there's a lot of prevalent myths in our society. Um, and you make a good point of what they do is they silence survivors. They'll silence survivors, they'll minimize their experiences. Um, they'll often blame survivors for their assault. Um, a lot of those, and whenever I do my presentations, I share these with people is that oftentimes, or the thought is that sexual assault only happens to young, attractive women. People think that this is not something that happens to older folks. This is not something that happens to men or folks of other genders. And we know that it does. And a male survivor who may experience sexual assault, they may downplay their experiences and validate their own experiences of, well, this doesn't happen to guys. You know, this is something that happens to women, just women. Um, so what happened to me isn't sexual assault. When we know that by definition, it's sexual assault. Um, we know that sexual assault happens to the elderly. We know that sexual assault happens with children. Um, another myth, too, is that people think that only women who dress provocatively or go out at night or drink too much or are seen as more um, the term like loose, you know, um, that they are the ones that are sexually assaulted. And that's, you know, placing the blame on them. And we hear that with questions. Well, what were you wearing? Well, what did you expect when you were behaving that way? Well, why did you go out at night? Why were you out alone? Things like that. And ultimately, it's the perpetrator's fault. The perpetrator chooses to sexually assault someone despite whatever the survivor was doing. And we know that it's not just women who are doing these things who are sexually assaulted. Go ahead, sorry. No, go ahead. Yeah, but these are the oh, ideas we have. I was gonna have. ask mm -hmm. you. Yeah, the ideas we have is exactly what I was gonna ask you is, um, you mentioned definition. 
And I think it's important that we clarify, like, like you said, what is, how would you define sexual assault in your, in your words? Yeah. Um, sexual assault, the way that we define it is as an umbrella term. So there's the general sexual assault term, and then there's different forms of sexual assault that fall underneath it, different examples. When we define sexual assault, it's any sexual contact. This could be physical, this could be verbal, this could be visual, that occurs without the other person's consent. And oftentimes people think it's just physical touch. They think it's just if some, you know, if it's rape, it's sexual penetration, or if it's unwanted groping, if it's unwanted caressing, and yes, those are examples. Um, but there's also verbal, right? There's the sexual comments, there's the cat calling on the streets. It's visual, it's exposing someone to an image that's explicit that they did not want to see. It's someone sending unsolicited nude pictures to someone else, things like that. Um, so it's not just physical touch. And oftentimes those ones that aren't considered first are invalidated. Um, so that myth again of, oh, sexual assault is only physical touch. Well, if someone's walking to school, walking to work and they're getting catcalled, they don't feel safe. They feel violated. Um, and what do we say like, oh, well, that's expected, walk a different way, cover up, right? We minimize that experience when we know that's not the issue. The issue isn't what they were wearing. The issue isn't the way that they're walking. The problem is what the perpetrator's actions are, what they think is okay and it's acceptable when it's not. Mm -hmm. And what you're probably seeing so much, Bianca, is the long I'm sorry, my internet, I think is coming in and out, but is um, the effects of this, the long-term trauma that you're seeing from people who have been victims of or experienced sexual assault, correct? I mean, right. this is something that often goes for a long time. Yeah, that's, that's a really good point that you make. And that's what people don't understand when they say certain statements, like they were asking for it, because we hear that too with, with myths, like, oh, someone's dressed a certain way because they're asking for it. And we have to clarify that no one's asking to go through something like this. This is a traumatic experience that someone goes through that they have to heal from. And not only that, it affects many other aspects of their life, right? It affects their work. It affects, you know, um, their day to day, it affects their school, if they're in school. Um, so it's not something that someone is asking to go through. Exactly. And I'm, I remember there are spokespeople that stand out for me. And I remember when Lady Gaga um, described and really was very sexual. Mm -hmm. in her life it had traumatized her on a physical level and she had long-term effects so this is really not something we just can push aside right. um, and i'm so glad that stessa is here a place that someone can go anonymously mm -hmm and get the support they need so they can start on their recovery. What kinds of services are you offering to people who are needing your support? Yeah, so all of our services at the moment um, are available through non-contact methods. And the one of them being is that 24 hour hotline that, that I introduced in the beginning. So it's a confidential hotline, it's bilingual. Um, it's available to anyone who wants to process with an advocate, either about a personal experience, an experience of a loved one. Um, sometimes, you know, big cases come up on the news or we hear about situations in our own community that make us fear for things or make us want to process. So it's really available to anyone um, who needs that sort of service. Um, it's also confidential. And this is very important for youth because they can call and not give any information about themselves and we won't have to make a report. If they call, they don't give their name, they don't give their age, that's perfectly fine. Um, other services include counseling. So we do crisis counseling, long-term counseling. Um, we have uh, advocacy and accompaniment. So 
We allow a survivor to choose how they want to proceed. If they choose to go to law enforcement, we're there to support them through the process. Um, and if they choose not to, they can still receive counseling, but we're really there to, to walk them through the process and offer emotional support as well. Um, and then our education services. So what I do is going out into the community and asking and um, having conversations yeah. with people about all of this because we're trying to bring awareness. Um, and then self-defense as well. So we do self-defense self workshops in the community um, that very much focus on empowerment. Oh, that's great. Um, and I, again, I apologize that I'm coming in and out. I've tried to adjust my internet, but I, where I'm living and working is in a remote area. So I apologize. It's okay. Um, I wanted to ask you, if you can hear, I wanted to ask you if, um, what brought you to this work and to talk about your passion for this work or what drew you to doing this personally? Um, well, it all started, <laughs> it all started, um, I think in undergrad. So I came to school, um, I did undergrad here at UC Santa Barbara. And that's when like my mind was just like, wide open because I took in so much information and especially from my feminist studies courses. And then I started to have a passion for social justice issues. Um, I went on and I did grad school and I knew that that's what I wanted to do with my work. I wanted to work with marginalized populations. I wanted to work um, in, in changing things for the better. Um, and then when I was in grad school, I became involved just with the same folks from my cohort. Uh, we started talking about sexual assault. And I remember we organized a little, it was called the Survivor Alliance, where we, um, I think it was for the month of April, we created just like a little tabling event where we had folks um, uh, write supportive messages to survivors. So really it came from all of that, a passion to make change, a passion to support people. Um, and then it all just kind of worked out for me where when I graduated, I found this job and I remembered it as the Santa Barbara Rape Crisis Center, but now, you know, they were under a new name. And um, so to me, it just, it just worked out, it worked out for me. And now that I'm a year and a half in, I start to realize that all of it's connected, that my passion for challenging systems of oppression, for changing societal ideals, they all come together when we talk about sexual assault, because you can't end sexual assault without ending all forms of oppression. So it's really been a nice mix of everything that I'm passionate about. Mm -hmm. And and so much it's that I really appreciate what you just said because it made me think about all the work that's ha happening now of, on equality, racial justice, and all forms of supremacy and oppression mm -hmm. that we're grappling with in the nation. And that involves a lot of um, oppression toward women in some cases, or sexual orientation, or people who um, are unseen in some way and that don't feel like they have a right to um, demand justice for any what's been inflicted upon them. Right. Um, fear of speaking out because they're immigrants or they have language barriers or they're they're not documented. What would mm -hmm. you say to that? Because there's people so afraid to to stand up, to speak out because of the repercussions. Right, yeah, those are very valid statements. And we know that it's very difficult for survivors to disclose their sexual assault um, because of all of those things. If they, er, there's like um, a distrust of law enforcement, if they don't see law enforcement as a resource, if um, they're afraid to even go into a law enforcement agency because they're undocumented, if there's a language barrier, things like that. And we, of course, cannot pressure a survivor to share their story. Um, that's really up to them. We can't encourage them. Um, it's really up to them and where they are in their healing. If they choose to keep it to themselves for a bit, for a while, or for however long they need to, we have to respect that. We have to respect their choices. Um, as allies, as someone who's trying to be supportive, we all, all we need to do is we need to believe, we need to listen, and we need to support. So there's a narrative around sexual assault where sexual assault survivors aren't often believed. Um, their credibility is questioned. They bring in other situations. Oh, that was a long time ago. They're making it up for money. They're making it up for revenge, things like that. Um, and that's a very harmful narrative where if a survivor sees that, oh, that survivor wasn't believed. I'm not gonna be believed either. I'm gonna keep it to myself. So we have to start changing that. 
if someone does come up to us and tell us, oh, I was sexually assaulted, let them know that you believe them. That's the first step. Um, also listening, listen to the person, listen to their needs, listen to as much as they are willing to give you in that moment. Don't push for details. Um, and then you can offer support in different ways. If they don't wanna go to law enforcement, that's totally fine. They don't have to report, but you can offer a hotline. Hey, did you know about Stessa? Like, here's a flyer. This is what they do, things like that. Um, and then just flat out asking them, well, what can I do to support you in this moment? What do you need from me? They could say, well, I just need someone to listen to me. Well, can you actually come with me to my counseling meeting? I don't wanna go alone. So there's many different ways that we can be allies, but really it's based on what the survivor needs for themselves. Um, and what they choose to do um, for their, to heal. Oh, that's so important because it's being sensitive to where that person is right now mm -hmm. and not pushing them and just being there and allowing just so much what we do with psychological first aid and when we deal with trauma and we, we listen and, and we listen to what they have to say and how we can help them and be an ally to them. Mm -hmm. So I think that what you're doing is allowing that process of healing by them taking, you know, ownership. And that's when it comes to trauma, that's so important that then they feel like autonomous beings. Yeah. You know, yeah. It's, it's empowering after a sexual assault, someone will feel, yeah, someone will feel disempowered. They would feel like what, you know, they had no control over their body, what they had no control over the situation. So really giving them the choice to choose how they want to heal and how they want to proceed. Um, that's the empowerment piece of that. That's so important. Mm -hmm. So what I'd like to do right now, Bianca, I'm going to stop our interview for a moment and then pick it up again. Mm -hmm. And um, so we'll put a pause on here and then we'll pick it up in a moment. So okay.